Hello. Um, well, what I'd like to do first is uh, to sort of recreate some of the spirit of the moth here. Um, we have a lot of animal exuberance in the moth. What we actually like to do is to ask, was particularly when we do our, our moth slams in New York, it's usually a, a, a pretty young crowd, so I don't know if I'm going to be able to get you all to do this, but we ask everyone to make animal noises. So I, what I'd like to do is to split this room in half. So anybody on this side of the room, can you all figure out some kind of a, some kind of a dog uh, or a wolf or, uh, or, or bird noise? <laughs> and as loud as you can, shout it out when I say three. One, two, three. <laughs> All right, it's very good. <laughs> All right, I'm a little surprised. I'm actually very impressed by y'all. Okay, so now, now on the other side of the room, if y'all would do, let's do cats, uh, uh, tigers, and, and, and any kind of primate that you like. And actually, actually, any kind of animal here that I haven't mentioned, you could do an insect or, <laughs> or a fish. But you have to be louder. The, than the dogs were. All right, one, two, three. That's very good. Okay, now everybody at once on the count of three, the dogs versus the cats, one, two, three. I just wanted to give you a feel for what uh, uh, moth evenings are like. We're, um, they're very raucous. I, I think that the thing that most terrifies me in life has always been premature burial. You all, <laughs> you all may know this true story by Poe about the, about the woman who died and her husband was so much in love with her and um, put her in her coffin and in the mausoleum and then uh, a couple of years went by and he started to feel that she was probably terribly cold and lonely, so he brought her flowers to the mausoleum, and when he opened the mausoleum door, this object fell into his arms, dressed in white linen, and it was his wife's skeleton, because, of course, she wasn't, re she hadn't been really dead. She'd awoken from her coma and rocked the coffin off the shelf, and it broke open, and so she was free, except she could never get out of the mausoleum, so she died in there. And this is just the most terrifying story in the world. Uh, I think, you know, I think there just couldn't be anything more terrifying than premature burial, except being addicted to the internet. <laughs> and I think that they're actually very similar things, because in, you know, when you go on the internet, you leave this rich world behind and you step into this little 
gray casket and crawl in there and are just crammed in there with all the world's stupidity. Um, with people that you would never consort with normally. I mean, you never would have any interest in Lindsay Lohan or Charlie <laughs> Sheen. But, but you're crammed in there and you know, and, and I, almost everybody I know is in some way addicted to the internet. Everybody thinks, well, you know, I'm just going to go on for five minutes and check my emails. And then, years later, <laughs> you, know, you, know, you know, you get all, you say, what, uh, how long have I been on? Well, you know, you, um, uh, your life is gone. <laughs> you know, you look like Rip Van Winkle. I, um, I have a nightmare that I'm uh, attacking technology at a technology conference. <laughs> but I'm actually, uh, I actually feel pretty good. I don't feel that the internet is going to destroy us because I believe that the kids are, are rising up. And I'm traveling, you know, all over, all over the country now um, uh, for the moth. And it seems to me that there are uh, at least I don't know what, you know, maybe it's only 1%, but there are a bunch of kids who, who have been raised on the internet and they're turning off to, to these hollow promises. And uh, I, I, I think that they've just decided that these gadgets are not going to make them any happier. And they are ready to step back from that world. And they're, you know, I know all these kids now who are not on Facebook. They don't want to have anything to do with the internet. And at night, they either gather around and listen to music or they come to the moth. We have now, uh, you know, uh, we have moths in New York and Chicago and LA and Detroit and uh, Boston and Atlanta. And we're opening 10 more moths. Uh, around the country uh, where we have uh, regular shows and we have touring shows that actually go all around the world. We were at Turkmenistan uh, last year and women uh, you know, in burqas lined up around the block to come and tell stories. And we have, uh, we have the moth on radio. You know, we just won the Peabody Award, by the way. Um, and I think... I think the moth is now playing on Thursday nights at 7, I think, here. Um, so uh, you all should uh, listen in. And it's, it's um, considered the most popular new radio show in 35 years. And we have 2 million uh, listeners to the, um, you know, the podcast. But mostly it's just about people coming into these rooms where, there are, where there's no electronics. And, um, and they sit down and they tell these stories. And they have these kind of... Uh, you know, just these amazing nights of being with real people. And it really begins to feel like a movement. When we uh, are going around uh, the country now, it's just really, you get hundreds of kids lining up to go into the moth because there, there's something, you know, it feels kind of new to them. And we really feel as though we might have started a global movement. And we like to say that it's, this is the first uh, global movement to come out of Southeast Georgia since the Girl Scouts. Because, <laughs> you know, I, I started the moth uh, really down in St. Simon's Island where, where I grew up. We'd just sit around and we'd listen, you know, to each other's stories and we'd drink bourbon all night and the stories would get better and better and it just, <laughs> it just seemed like this amazing, rich experience. So years later in New York, I started this, and, but it still, it still has a great feeling of Southeast Georgia. And in fact, our greatest raconteur, I think, at the Moth is, actually, I think really the greatest living raconteur, and I hope the sound is good enough so you can get a little impression of his richness, is a Savannah native. Uh, he'll be here on June, June 11th. He's going to be out in, uh, he's going to be up in Charleston um, uh, at the Spilato Festival. But uh, what I'd like for you all to do is um, we'll first give him a big animal noise and a hand for, for Edgar Oliver, and then, and then when he's done, uh, when his little you know, movie clip is, is over, one more huge animal moth cheer. So, ladies and gentlemen, e Edgar Oliver. Kelly? <laughs> more! More! Louder! Yeah.
They won't understand you. We're different. We're artists. So all throughout my childhood, it was just the three of us, mother, Helen, and me. And then there was the world, as though we were lost in it. We were like three lost children. Mother, Helen, and me. No one ever made it into our house, especially relatives. <laughs> one was deeply suspicious of relatives. And if some old friend from Mother's past did dare to pay a visit, they wouldn't have been there very long. Or Mother would begin sobbing and screaming, you've been listening to the vicious gossip about me. I can tell. You've been listening to the vicious gossip about me. And she would advance on them. And they would back out the front door and flee, never to return. At which point, we would all three run outside and jump in the car and zoom off and mother driving like a maniac. Um, all throughout my childhood, we drove obsessively uh, at least 200 miles a day, <laughs> sometimes 300. Um, uh, anywhere, really, we were in this drive. It didn't matter where we went, just as so long as we were on the go. Um, and Helen and I did our homework in the car, which to this day, I believe deeply affected both my and Helen's handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much. That's not animals.